Welcome to the Tuesday edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 682. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is August 24, 2021. Good morning and welcome to another show. Well, it's probably not morning when you're watching this. Uh, I don't watch it until like 5 p.m. in Eastern uh, Daylight Time in here in America. So when I say good morning, it's when George and I are recording the show. Uh, usually we, we grab a cup of coffee and hopefully by 9 a.m. our local time, we're sitting down in front of the computer having a pre-show talking about what we're going to talk about. And uh, usually in August, uh, at least the last 10 years, August are slow. And we're going to find a little bit of slow stories this morning. Just bear with us. We have also relocated Monstro. We're no longer in, uh, where were we? We're southeastish Wisconsin. We're now up in Door County. And uh, for our viewers, let me show you where that is. No, that's not it. Uh, this is a quick map of the United States. That's everything. And I thought I'd show you guys where Door County is. And if you zoom in here, you see this little uh, peninsula that goes off of Wisconsin. Well, at the very, very tip here, it's uh, uh, Door County, and we're just north here of Sister Bay. And we'll be camping here for a couple weeks, and yeah, it's fun to do. Part of our travels. Can, yeah. Can you swim in the lake in the in the Great Lakes, or is it too cold, or what? No, is, it, it, I've never been there. I've never okay. been that far north. I uh, you can swim here on the uh, west side. Uh, it's a little warmer. Uh, people, there's beaches here along all the state parks. On the Michigan, Lake Michigan side, it's a little cool, but people still do it. Um, so if you don't mind 70 degree water, it's fine. Uh, if you want to get... How cold? 70. Well, because the uh, Tampa Bay right now is at 92 degrees. I know. I know <laughs> if you'd like a bath. <laughs> Just dip in my toes there or any place on the... Uh, uh, the far east coast between uh, North Carolina and Florida is very warm this time of year. Connecticut's not bad, but you know, here we are giving the, the water reports around the world. Uh, you know, uh, Wisconsin, people come here in Door County in August because we're avoiding the heat and humidity and haziness of the rest of the world like where George is in uh, near Orlando, Lucanto. Uh, how is it down there, George, this week? very hot on last friday i we we couldn't record because i had to go to uh another church in the diocese who were very kind to give me a great deal of educational material and i rented a truck and my wife and i were loading the truck well she was sitting in the cab pointing where she wanted stuff and i loaded the truck i have to tell you i got so i got dizzy after about a half hour it was so hot it's the heat index has been over a hundred for a few weeks now, where that what that essentially the weathermen tell us because when the temperature is in the mid to high nineties, and you have ninety to one hundred percent humidity, it all bundles together to make it uh, a little uncomfortable for people who are not used to it. Yeah, and, and I think for the last ten years they've they've always reported in the weather real feel. What's the real feel? Yeah, it could be ninety two, but the real feel is just short of 212 boiling over temperature. So um, you, you get the real impression that uh, uh, it humidity is not your friend. But here, here's the thing. I mean, people would say, oh, my goodness, I could never go swimming in a 92 degree ocean. When you step in <laughs> and it's good. it's 10 to 15 degrees cooler than the air, what feels the air around you. So it is refreshing. Mm -hmm. um, the only thing is that if you stay in too long, you'll come out as a piece of poached salmon or something. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> but it's still fun. Um, we got lots of stories to cover this week, but before we do, please like the uh, the show. It's free. You, you're doing something free. Likes are free. Uh, share this with your friends, family, and foes. Uh, please go to the comment section. Lots of great comments we got. Uh, last week subscribe if you're not subscribed and we have a podcast for those who just want to listen to us uh, gab about the anglican news lots of stories first good news story we have a new province george uh if you could give us the update yes the Ang the general secretary of the anglican consultative council josiah wood wrote to the primates this week 
and said that a two-thirds majority of primates had approved the 40th official, 41st for the Gafcon people, <laughs> province of the Anglican Communion. I was say And 41. that is, okay. Uh, that is, actually there are 41 provinces, but only 40 are members of the Anglican Consultative Council. Uh, the 40, and that new one is called IAMA, Igreja Anglicana de Mozambique y Angola. Uh, the, our first good news story for the last month seems to be from Angola, and now we continue that uh, trajectory. Let's see. Uh, it was reported that uh, a two thirds majority, uh, nobody voted no, one province abstained, and uh, the rest all voted yes who returned their ballots. But a quorum was reached, and so now we have uh, the first Portuguese-speaking province in Africa. We've got uh, Portuguese churches, of course, in Brazil, but these are the former Portuguese colonies of Mozambique and Angola. And they have, uh, Kevin asked me, well, George, in between them is Zimbabwe and Zambia. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I, had uh, a I had a question because if, you, if you're doing a geographical province somewhere, uh, you're skipping the, the country in the middle. And George was quick to point out, well, they all speak the same language. I said, okay, that makes sense. Um, but uh, I was always taught in geography that on the west coast was Angola and on the east coast was Mozambique. And there's uh, uh, Zambia and Zimbabwe kind of in between them. What's going on, George? Well, of course, Zambia and Zimbabwe were uh, British colonies. Mozambique and Angola were Portuguese colonies for about 500 years. And so their uh, identity is as Lusitanian, uh, which is the Latin, Latinized word for Portuguese influence places. So it, what becoming a new province means is that they've got the financial wherewithal to do it. They have the sufficient number of dioceses, and now they're set to take off and chart their own destiny. They used to be part of the Anglican Church in Southern Africa, um, but now they're going to be heading off and doing their own thing. So, cool. so Gafcon, get on the te telephone and make some phone calls because you may act quickly and get somebody on your side. I think that's already happened. If I, if I know my rumors correctly, uh, let's talk uh, about our uh, third story, which is always uh, a Church of England story, sometimes bad. Well, may, may I just give a little bit of inside baseball? Every time conservative dioceses flake off or split off to form their own little group, it usually leaves the la the the original province more liberal. And this will probably be the case in South, Southern Africa, because the Angolans and Mozambique dioceses were fairly traditional in teachings on human sexuality and all these other issues. And South Africa is not. Now there's less of a conservative counterweight within the House of Bishops of Southern Africa. Oh, I absolutely agree. Uh, South Africa as a province it was not just trending liberal, it was solidly liberal, uh, especially when it came to sexuality. Um, on to Church of England. Uh, now, I'm going to go back in time here. Five, six, seven years ago. when uh, Five years ago, the, the scandal with Hillary Clinton's uh, server, uh, where she had all her private email and her uh, Secretary of State e email collected on a server she kept in her home completely unsecure as an IT professional I'll let you know you just you, that's just not done uh, especially for uh, government emails and every Friday when this was being investigated uh, about 4 or 4 30 the FBI would do what we call a document dump we're going to put everything we've learned this week about Hillary Clinton and her server and we're going to dump it over the weekend when the 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 hostile press or the press that uh, uh, has weekends off uh, isn't going to be there to investigate it. We just dump it. Boom, gone. Document dump. And lo and behold, you come Monday, you weren't hearing a lot about uh, what was said about all the th stuff they found about Hillary's server. It worked. Friday dunk document dumps are a proven way to be sure you let people know what's going on, 
but you be sure that the best press aren't looking at it. And this is what's happened now with the Titus Trust, George. They did a document dump on Friday with the Jenison Smythe uh, investigation, and we don't take the weekend off. So what, what did we learn from the document dump? Well, the Titus Trust did a document dump where they released all the documents and a timeline of the John Smythe abuse investigations, answering the questions through a chronology of what they knew when. And it's a lot, you know, they released information about things that people didn't know. And they're quite keen to dispel any claim that they were engaged in cover-up. Uh, I'll just pause and say the Titus Trust is the entity that ran the Uern, it's spelled Iwern, Uern camps, which were camps for public school or boys, which are private school boys in England, uh, where they uh, were sort of imbi imbibed with uh, uh, muscular Christianity, you know, prayers, push ups, and cold showers. And Smythe was a leader at these camps, and he would bring boys to his home and in sort of fake religiosity beat them savagely to beat the sin out and this was a tremendous scandal and Smythe was had to leave England went to Zimbabwe continued his evil ways a boy died in one of his camps in Zimbabwe wound up in, in Cape Town and eventually passed away but this has been a scandal because who knew what, when, and why was this never passed to the police? And Andrew Greystone, who's an advocate for the abuse, wrote a rejoinder, which we published on Anglican Inc., uh, following the Titus Trust document dump. And he said, what this tells us is nothing before 2012. And before 2012 is when everything happened. People knew about this before then, but there's, it's absent from this report. And second, what it shows is that insiders in the Titus Trust knew about this, but didn't tell the full board, and took three years to turn over their original reports to the police, so that eventually everything was turned over, but it took years uh, to do the right thing and the legal thing, when all along they said they're just being you know, compliant and they want what's best for everybody. Yeah, ha well, no. Having read through the documentation, everything that was dumped is the truth, but you can tell it's not the whole truth. You know, it's not the full timeline of who knew what when and what maybe was the Archbishop of Canterbury's role in when he knew, um, because he says he knew nothing. Yeah, this is one of these things that it probably looks good for PR purposes to have done this. Mm-hmm. But they released enough information so that people can look at this and say, there's more here. We can tell. And so actually it just whets the appetite rather than ends the argument, uh, ends the discussion. So I'm sure the police will be uh, taking a hard look at this. I'm sure people in the abuse at, at a survivor's community will be taking a hard look at this and saying, hey, you mentioned this, but we know this happened too. Why are you silent? Or this person knew in 2012, but why do you have him saying he's finally talking about it in 2017? In other words, this, this gives ammunition. Uh, if you're a defense lawyer, you don't want this stuff out there. But uh, they've done it, and good for them, but this certainly doesn't end the Titus Trust abuse Smythe fiasco. There's more to be learned, and, and, and certainly, but we do thank them for you know, telling us what they, they have so far. Uh, but we do expect more. Um, next story. Kind of, uh, there's, there's a bit of Kevin in this story. I was not always an Episcopalian slash Anglican. I was actually uh, brought to faith in the United Church of Christ in my high school years, uh, somewhere south of Madison here in it was a town called Verona where uh, my family went to church and uh, I went to middle school and high school. When I went to college, uh, all my roommates were Episcopalians. And the Episcopalian church in college was across the street where the UCC church was across campus. So when 9 a.m. Sunday morning rolled around, which church did I go to? 
<laughs> the one across the street well, it was a, a Grace Episcopal Church here in the square in Madison, Wisconsin. And it's part of the Milwaukee Diocese. Um, and so I have a bit of familiarity with uh, Episcopalianism, uh, certainly in Wisconsin and certainly in Madison, where it's, it's very liberal, of course. My roommate at the time uh, was Matthew Payne, and he's the communications person uh, and historian for the Diocese of Fond du Lac. And we're going to talk about what the Diocese of Fond du Lac, the Diocese of Eau Claire, and the Diocese of Milwaukee are trying to do, George. They're looking for the future. Because in Wisconsin and in the Midwest, mainline denominations, including the Episcopal Church, are shrinking in numbers. Uh, tremendously so. And there's just no resources to pay for management, for bishops, for dioceses, uh, for deacon, uh, deaneries for that matter. What are we going to do? Uh, we see the collapse in Michigan, Western Michigan. What's Wisconsin going to do? There's three dioceses here, and one is barely feasible uh, at this stage. So they got together, and what are they going to do, George? Well, two of the three dioceses have the bishop either retiring or retired. Matt mm -hmm. Gunter in Fond du Lac is basically running the show and uh, acting as the acting bishop of Eau Claire. I don't know if he's doing anything in Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. I don't think. I think the bishop, the former Jeffrey, uh, the former bishop of Chicago, I think, is sorting, holding the hands of the Milwaukee diocese. Well, the Episcopal layout in in Wisconsin is imbalanced. In Milwaukee and its suburbs, there are 30 Episcopal churches, where I think that's more than the number of Episcopal churches in the Northwest, where Eau Claire is. And Eau Claire and Fond du Lac have more rural congregations, small town congregations, and the population centers, uh, Madison and Milwaukee, uh, are in the Diocese of Milwaukee. And so they're looking to ways to sort of work and come together. Does that mean merging the three dioceses? That's an option. Does it mer mean merging two of the three? That's another option. Uh, but in September, the standing committees of all three dioceses are going to get together and try to figure out how to make this a long-term viable solution. Part of the issue is churchmanship. Uh, Fond du Lac, uh, especially Eau Claire, to a lesser extent, but still so, are high Anglo-Catholic churches. That, that has been their tradition for 175 years. Mm -hmm. Milwaukee is more in the liberal Catholic uh, persuasion. Still Anglo-Catholic, but more liberal in its practices. And the, the standing committees may not want to be merged because they don't really sort of see eye to eye on some of the major hot button issues. But finances may push them to act in ways that they may not be comfortable with theologically. So these are good. To, it's good to have these discussions, especially before you bring on board new bishops. Uh, um, and so, with one bishop for three dioceses right now, they're actually in a good spot to sort of pull everything together if that is their choice. Um, but. Well, it's 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 a lot of ground to cover if they're going to have a single bishop. Maybe they give a bishop and, a, and an assistant bishop or a suffragan bishop. But Wisconsin, it's not like Connecticut. Okay, I'm going to use Connecticut as a, a geographical lesson for you. Via car on the interstate, Connecticut is 90 minutes wide and 60 minutes high. If you come here to Wisconsin and you want to start in the south and drive all the way to the most northern congregation uh, in the state, that's a seven and a half to eight hours in your car. And, and width-wise, it's five hours. And it's, it's not easy to get up and down through Wisconsin. The interstates are a little haywire. I know I'm, I'm in Wisconsin. A little haywire, a little screwy. Nobody was you know, thinking, how are we going to get through Wisconsin? They're thinking, how do we get from Chicago to Minneapolis? And that's how they put their interstate in. And so, you know, it's it's a little screwy here if you're going to have one bi uh, bishop cover a whole state. This isn't the state for one bishop. Well, the, the problem the Episcopal Church is having of aging congregations mm -hmm. and smaller and smaller congregations is one faced by the Lutherans. The, whichever brand of Lutheranism you want, you mm -hmm. can find it in Wisconsin. Absolutely. And the Lutherans are having a problem, and the Methodists are having a problem. Everybody in the mainstream and the Catholics are having a problem. The only people who are doing 
well are the Pentecostals in Wisconsin. Um, they're alive and vibrant and uh, picking the, and they're a attracting lot, younger people. The, and there's a large, uh, especially here in, in northeastern Connecticut, I'm, I'm seeing signs for what I would call patriotic evangelicalism. Um, you know, a little off kilter evangelicalism is happening here in, in the Northeast, uh, from what I can tell. So Northeast of Wisconsin, yeah. and not Northeast of Connecticut. <laughs> no, that's jeez, no. <laughs> so it's um, it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. Uh, we would hope at some point the church all main line denominations can stop the downward trend. Um, but uh, at some point they gave up on the youth and the youth are not going to church now. So it's a shame. All right, back to our stories. Um, we've got Swedes in the story, George. Uh, yeah, we're going to go, keep it in the upper Midwest. Yeah, yes, we'll get to. Going from Wisconsin, to, uh, Norwegian territory, German territory to the Swede territory. Uh, tell me about our Swede story. They, they decided that there's no more long, well, they haven't decided, they're going to debate whether or not uh, they need a conscious clause. Well, the Swedish Synod, which I can't even pronounce, it's got a lot of K's in it and uh, Y's and little funny dots over the letters, um, meets in September. And one of the major issues they will discuss is same-sex marriage. In 2009, the Church of Sweden authorized same-sex marriage, but they adopted a conscience clause. Clergy could not be compelled or required to perform same-sex marriages. Uh, at this stage, they, I don't know whether it's let, they're um, 18, uh, 17 or 18, it's not diocese, but there are 17 or 18 sort of voting blocks in the Synod. Eleven want to compel the those who are against gay marriage to perform gay marriages or be kicked out of the Church of Sweden. They're basically one short of a two-thirds majority which would allow them to do that. Six are opposed. And so the issue at the Church of Sweden Synod next month will be should we drop the conscience clause? And so 2009 to 2021 that's uh, 12 years, and I think it was Richard John Newhouse who said that where orthodoxy is is optional, it will soon be proscribed. And we're seeing that play out in the Church of Sweden. We saw that, we've seen this play out in the Church of England and the Episcopal Church. We saw that the Episcopal Church, starting with, well, Fort Worth and o o Eau Claire and Fond du Lac and Springfield and all these places can be traditionalist in San Joaquin, and we won't compel you to do anything you don't want to do until we have a big enough majority in the general convention to force you to do what we don't want to do and the end result is goodbye bill love yeah uh we'll yeah. make you uh you'll be we will compel you to violate your conscience and religious beliefs we saw this in the church of england where we will have you know continue to honor the various diversities and and you know by being an opponent of women's ordination this will not penalize you in the hierarchy well, since that time, how many traditionalist deans, bishops, uh, archdeacons have been nominated? Essentially none. The promises were not kept, not even attempted to be kept. No, I mean... And now in the Church of Sweden, we're going down the same road. When you hear the words, and this is just a future lesson for everybody here, mutual flourishing, run. Okay. There, there will be no mutual flourishing. It just means in a dozen years, your belief set will not be allowed uh, to have any leadership in the church. And uh, you, you said the Church of England, we've seen that also in other denominations. I think the Church of Sweden, are they, they're Lutheran, right? Yes. Or an offshoot of they're Lutheranism. Lu they're Lutheran, uh, they're Episcopal Lutheran. Mm -hmm. uh, unlike the Germans, uh, they kept uh, the historic Episcopate like the uh, Church of England did. But they are probably the most liberal Lutheran groups, just like the Swedes are the most liberal Europeans, or on some issues, uh, not all issues. And but the Church of Sweden is, if the Church of England is the public library of England, it's is in the the Church of Sweden has even less hold over its people than the Church of England. And one of the problems of the Church of Sweden is that the political parties are members of the General Synod, so that 
you think we have a tough time in the Episcopal Church with liberals and conservatives, they call themselves Republican. They would call themselves Republicans and Democrats, and we'd fight out the national politics on the local church scene. So the political parties. So if the political party in the Swedish Parliament is pro-gay marriage, its representatives in the Synod of the Church of Sweden will push gay marriage. Um, it, it's Erastianism taken to its most crazy consequence yes, of just oh, being the church is the tail that is wagged by the dog of the state. Okay, George, we're getting down to our last couple stories here. Um, we got the Biden story, the Afghanistan story, and the Australia story. Um, do you want to do the the uh, the Biden one first? Sure. All right. So uh, well, I, I just want to back this up because I remember in the eighties, um, back when I was in school, the school I dropped out of a long time ago, uh, they had a Christian club, and one day the atheists showed up in mass when there was elections, and they elected a atheist to be a leader of the Christian club. I don't remember if it was. It wasn't a mainline one, uh, like Campus Crusade, but it was one of the, the, the local uh, uh, Christian ones, and they just did it as a joke. But it went on to be fought in court. And this is a long, long time ago. We saw Trump put into place a measure that says uh, Christians are allowed to elect Christian leaders in campuses. Biden says that's yes. not, uh, not going to be so anymore. It's the Trump Christian groups on campus have had a hard time in the past 20 plus years, mm -hmm. especially from the administration. And in a number of cases in the Obama years, the, uh, the universities with the support of the Department of Education would compel Christian groups to have non-Christians as members. So that in your example, where non-Christians could be elected to be an officer of a Christian club if they sort of showed up for the meeting, uh, just to and anybody can join, and you don't have and you're not allowed to enforce a, a conscience clause or or a faith statement. Well, the Trump administration, uh, Department of Education, adopted a free inquiry rule, which said that clubs that are strictly built around uh, religious principles or purposes may restrict its membership and leaders to those who practice these beliefs, so that. A Jewish Orthodox club, maybe a small number of Jewish Jewish Orthodox students, could not one day, when they have their election, find all the Palestinian students come register and lead the Jewish club just to destroy it and to embarrass it. Well, the Biden administration, and this was done under the free access, free association clause and free exercise of religion clause, and part of the President Trump's support for religious liberty. The Depart Biden Department of Education is in the public comment time for issuing new rules which will get rid of the free inquiry rule, which will allow universities to insist that uh, when I was in university a few years before Kevin, but the same decade, uh, it was starting where the administration said to all male fraternities, you must start taking girls. Um, we said, we don't want girls, <laughs> uh, but, and But eventually, but it was part of the designed to destroy the fraternity system. Not had nothing to do with women's equality because the girls had sororities and the girls didn't want to join the boys' fraternities and all this and that. Well, it's the same principle. You know, the universities are saying, well, you must have atheists in the Catholic club or in the Mormon club or this and that. And the Biden administration is now backing the liberal administrators who wish to destroy organized religion on college campuses. Yeah, and uh, it's sad that it can be done just at an executive level uh, in administration. Uh, it clearly, it's protected by uh, the Constitution in three different clauses, but uh, a lot of these places don't want to fight it in court. It's just not worth the money, the time, and they, they hope there's a new administration comes around and will re reverse the law, which has kind of happened in a pendulum way over the last... Uh, 20 years that we're still talking about well, this we, in 2021. Even if there was a big case in uh, Vermont where a nurse who had objected to abortion, mm -hmm. she was an obstetrics nurse, was compelled by the hospital where she worked to take part in an abortion procedure. She refused and was fired. 
The law says you cannot do that. You must honor the conscience of medical providers and not compel them to participate in abortions. Well, the Department of uh, Health and Human Services uh, and the Justice Department filed suit against the hospital for, for firing this nurse who wouldn't do an abortion because uh, it's still the law. Well, the Obama Justice Department, I'm sorry, the Biden Justice Department dropped the suit after it came into office. So it will not enforce laws on the books that it doesn't agree with politically. So we're going to see this, you know, if you have uh, students filing lawsuit for free speech and free assembly and religious liberty, the Trump administration's Justice Department would support it. The, Obama, the Biden administration uh, will, has, has demonstrably walked away and settled at or dropped cases that it doesn't agree with politically, even though the law says so. We've talked before about the pendulum of politics, especially here in America. And we talked about, you know, the pendulum effect of the Clintons, the pendulum effect of the Obamas, uh, now the Trumps, now Bidens. I'm not sure what I'm witnessing here on the, uh, with all the, this happened in the Biden administration in just six months, but I'm detecting a rapid pendulum swing coming, you know, certainly in, in two-year election cycle, and then maybe the four-year election cycle. I, I don't know what to say, um, but... Well, there is, is a, a hint of danger ahead for the Democrats uh, who are on the Biden team. There was a state Senate election for Norwalk area of Connecticut. Connecticut, liberal Connecticut. <laughs> and Joe Biden won that, beat Trump by like 20, 25 points. And a Republican conservative in a special election to fill, to fill a vacancy beat the Democrat mm -hmm. by seven or eight percentage points. Yeah, pro-gun, anti-abortion Republican took out. Low tax, low tax, <laughs> pro-gun, anti-abortion veteran, you know, things that are all the kiss of death in Connecticut, Connecticut politics. Yeah. In Norwalk, which is in, uh, what's that county down there? Uh, Greenwich. South, uh, Greenwich and Stanford, that area. Yeah. Uh, very liberal part of the United States. Mm -hmm. 30 points swing from the Democrats to the Republicans. So, I mean, that's telling. And it wasn't that they put forward, the Democrats put forward a child molester or somebody. I mean, they just put forward the next guy whose turn it was, yeah. who should by all rights been elected. I think and that's why so we're seeing signs. Wait, the biggest sign you'll see is they're trying to rush through as much stuff in two years as they can get. You know, what can we get done in two years? Because we know we've lost. And I've seen, you know, people send me all the time the the uh, fundraising. Okay, we're losing. We're going to lose. Send more money. You know, and so if they're already admitting that they're going to lose, uh, they're just trying to get as much done as possible in two years. So pendulum effect. But listen here. That'll go there, uh, the conservative way. This is right on your screen. That's right on my screen. Uh, so screen right, <laughs> conservative. And uh, the conservatives will get in, and they'll, they'll uh, upset a bunch of people for some reason, and the pendulum goes back again. And that's, that's American politics, left, right. Sometimes it's slow. Sometimes it's rapid and fast. I'm predicting rapid in the next two years. Afghanistan, Georgia, still in the news. Um, it is not a one-year tragedy. It's not a six-month, six-week tragedy. It's oh God, six decades uh, of unrest in the in the uh, country of Afghanistan. Uh, this is something that we could report on uh, back in the 1950s and the 1930s and, and onward. And it's so hard to watch because we're watching it now in real time thanks to the news and thanks to... Uh, in administration without a game plan on how to leave Afghanistan. When they say we want to withdraw, uh, Biden says withdrawal, I think he meant retreat. For all intents and purposes, I see no plan in how to protect the citizens on the ground from America and Europe and Western countries, um, how to uh, take out your assets, the, the guns, the uh, helicopters and everything else, and how to have guarantees that there's not going to be uh, attacks on those who helped us and uh, religion other than radical Islam in the country. And so now there's a vacuum being filled. 
And we've seen this again in the Middle East and again and again and again in Afghanistan. It's a mess, George. Yes, and we're getting reports that the persecution of Christians is now underway, mm -hmm. uh, Afghani Christians, where uh, the Taliban is reported. We have no first-hand knowledge, and what people are tweeting from the country can't be verified. Um, CNN has pulled out its reporters and this and that. And Well, what's happening that we're told is that they're going house to house, and they have lists of those who worked for the coalition forces, British, Germans, French, Americans, and so on and so forth. And they're arresting them, uh, kidnapping the women over the age of 12, executing in the street, uh, picking the men who may have served in the Afghani police or in the special force commandos, anybody who uh, is tainted with collaboration in the Caliban's mind. And it's a total fiasco, and the, the Caliban is cleverly playing the, the, the uh, allies against the, off against the Americans. For instance, the, the, French, uh, the French Foreign Legion has armored cars going through Kabul, picking up French citizens, and the Taliban waves them through. And the British are doing this, and the Germans, and the Czechs, and the Japanese are rescuing their civilians. They're not letting the Americans do this. And so the British press can say, uh, how can, you know, how terrible the Americans are that they're not able to rescue their own people. Well, the British are doing that because they're being allowed to by the Taliban. Oh, and uh, uh, hold on. Before we say allowed to, let me be very forthright and say that there's financial uh, payments being made here. Uh, you know, the, these people are hostages, and there was negotiations behind the scene uh, six weeks ago, and they're being allowed to because France, Germany, Britain all came to a financial agreement with the Taliban. What's it going to take to get our people out? Because the Americans are leaving faster than we thought they would. In fact, they didn't tell us they're leaving. Now we're screwed. So the Taliban is reaping some financial reward in this. Yes, and so in essence, funds frozen in... Uh uh, Germany that uh, belong to the old Afghan government are being made available to the Taliban and exchange the germ the uh, the Wehrmacht or the, no, I'm sorry the Bundeswehr uh, yes. the Bundeswehr <laughs> is allowed to go around with armored cars and pick up their people mm -hmm. uh, they don't want to do that with the United States because they have bigger fish to fry with America see the tal and and it sort of helps understand why um, I'm not defending American policy but the Taliban historically takes hostages for financial gain. And the U.S. military is trying to get as many of the Afghans who are on the death list out, sometimes at the expense ahead of Americans, because the Americans are not going to be killed because they're valuable. The Afghan collaborators are dead. And so if, if you're on the ground there, you know that you know, you've got a choice between the two. These people will be okay. It'll just cost Uncle Sam a few million bucks, and the and some will be executed out of show. Basically, what we're into is an Iran hostage crisis, like we had under Jimmy Carter. And the, but the game is much bigger, and the term much bigger with money. It's not helped the U.S. policy right now by Donald Trump's administration re releasing their, well, we had a plan which was we pull all the civilians out first, we destroy all the military stores, we render the military bases unusable, and the last people who go out are the army. And Trump's pointing out that the first people who went out under Biden were the army, and we forgot everybody else. It's, and he likened it to the captain of the ship abandoning ship before the passengers get in the lifeboats. Um, which may all be true, I don't know if this is just political gamesmanship, but it's just resulted in a political calculus where the Biden administration has, is losing support from the Democrats. It's lost the, the media on this issue. It's lost the American public. And this is... Yeah. It lost Actually, the this is Post. the worst. It lost the New York Times. It lost uh, CNN. It lost MSNBC. Uh, it may lose England Unscripted. 
Yeah. This is the worst calamity for American foreign policy and American civilians since the fall of the Philippines to the Japanese in 1942. Forget 9-11, forget all this other stuff. Oh, forget Saigon. In, this in the, it, yeah. Forget Saigon. In mm -hmm. other words, in the Philippines before the war, there were thousands of American civilians, plus mm -hmm. the American army. And it would be as if MacArthur pulled out before the Japanese landed. Uh, there would be no, in other words, this, this is the last thing comparable is the fall of the Philippines in 1942. Mm -hmm. And it's much worse than Saigon, uh, the fall of Saigon, yeah. because Americans were out. From from an Amer from American domestic perspective, the Americans were by and large out. There were a few missionaries, there were a few here or there, but there weren't tens of thousands of contractors who were still told to stay at work. Uh, and then they look around and the American army's gone and nobody told them. Uh, and now the Christians are going through persecution. And uh, that, America, that, needs, that needs to be our biggest concern here, is we don't want to see religious persecution, which is something that is the top of the chain of the Taliban, uh, is to enforce Sharia law, to enforce radical, not moderate Islam, and to be sure that uh, their way stays. They've lost Afghanistan, they've lost Iraq and Iran, uh, they don't want to lose it again, and they know the visualness of power is the way to keep it. And they can do that through violence. And thankfully, we'll have our C CNN will have embedded reporters, MSNBC will have embedded reporters. So anytime the Taliban want to make a show for the earth to see how violent they can be, we're there to cover it. The other thing we need to remember is there's something called MEMRI, Memory, Middle East Media Reporting Institute. They've been around for a long time now, and what they do is they publish the Arab and Farsi and Pushto. In other words, what the Taliban spokesman says in English is not what the Taliban tell the people of Afghanistan in uh, Farsi and Pushto and, yeah. and uh, Dare. So they translate these things, and so the promises that you've heard the Taliban spokesman tell the BBC and CNN, uh, oh, things will be different this time. Oh, we, you know, we've given an amnesty. But that's not what they're telling their own people in their own language. Yeah. Uh, turn over the traitors, and they're killed in the street. Yeah, and they are. There is a no capture policy with uh, ex Afghan army. You know, we we're not going to capture you. We're going to take you in the street, and you are the next demonstration. Of our brutality and you you know they're executed in the street they're worth the bullets yeah so what 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 a country right now to keep in your prayers uh, Afghanistan the entire Middle East for that matter um, because the influence that the Taliban have uh, is going to reignite Isis uh, it's going to reignite uh, uh, Sunni and Shina warfare you're gonna uh, see uh, moderate civil wars in the north of Afghanistan, which may reignite civil wars in Iraq, and places like Iran will just sit and watch. They'll watch and burn. And then they'll have uh, re-influence in the, in the countries of Afghanistan and Iraq in, in five or ten years when, the, when the, the smoke settles. So, welcome to Middle East politics. <sighs> Hate to depress you guys. Let's move on to Australia. Uh, oh, that's a depressing too. Um, I don't know how many people know this out there. Uh, Australia used to be a penal colony. It used to be a place where uh, people sent their prisoners. And uh, it's interesting as a uh, amateur historian to see history repeat itself because it looks like it's a penal colony all over itself, George. Uh, come full circle, Kevin. Come You're full right. Circle. Come full circle. Uh, and I. I you, let me just report the, the sneezing guy in the elevator, and then George will tell you even more worse stories. So all last week, they put out a basically an all-points bulletin for a guy who was caught sneezing in an elevator, um, alone in the elevator. It's on the security cam footage. He's, achoo, 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 uh, in Australia. He goes from the top floor to the bottom floor and then leaves the elevator, and they're like, he was spreading COVID. He's certainly infected with COVID. 
and this nation has just gone on a manhunt looking for the sneezing guy in the elevator. That's not the craziest story, George. There's more crazy stories about how Australia is reacting to the possibility of COVID, which, we'll be honest, COVID, there's more COVID cases and more COVID deaths happening in Australia. It's happening. But the reaction and overreaction of the leadership of Australia is embarrassing. It's dystopian. It's 1984 in paperback form, George. And Kevin, no, it's no, it's not happening. Um, there was one item I saw in the newspaper where a local council decided that they were going to kill all the dogs in a rescue shelter and not allow people to come and pick up the dogs that they had adopted, even though in that part of Australia there were no infections, there were no deaths, there was nothing. There was just the fear. And the local council decided to prevent people from coming to pick up dogs that they had adopted from a, from a shelter. They would kill all the animals so the people wouldn't come. Um, in New Zealand, there was one suspected case of COVID, and the prime minister shut locked down the country. This is for an illness that has a 99.997 survival rate for people under 18 and a 99.9 uh, something percent for 18 to 40. Mm -hmm. uh, this, more people will die under 40 from the vaccinations than they will from COVID at this stage. And there's one thing to be take prudent cautions, but it's quite another thing to have these mandates that have resulted in violence in the streets where the police you know, the Australian police can now, may, I think they must have hired a bunch of East German retirees from the Stasi, mm -hmm. how to uh, control the crowds. We're talking brutality of, you know, people who have not violated any law, just government mandates that were not enacted by the legislatures, but imposed by health departments or by bureaucrats or by uh, elected officials without any review. This stuff, uh, uh, in the United States, it may happen in some places, but the outcry, the outrage would be it. Well, our bishop, for instance, put out a, a letter. Uh, our bishop is quite uh, conservative on COVID issues. And he put out a letter because we've had an uptick in infection rates. We have not had any rise in the number of people dying. Mm -hmm. It's rather the rate of infection. So remember, it used to be we want to flatten the curve so people don't die. We're not talking about people dying anymore. We're people talking about people getting COVID. And the bishop sent out a letter saying, it is my expectation that you follow all these rules, taking us back to where we were in the darkest days. Well, I, being a good canon lawyer, uh, said to my congregation, um, I will wear a mask. I will wear gloves. I will social distance. We'll call, cancel our Bible studies. We'll have to have prepackaged food for coffee hour. But you can do whatever you want to do, because sure. I will not compel you to do what the bishop wants, because the bishop has no authority to do so under canon law, and actually under Florida state law, because the governor has banned mask mandates. And uh, a bishop's expectation is not the same thing as a bishop's pastoral directive. Uh, because, you know, basically I believe that uh, you have the freedom to choose for yourself we're well, not talking about polio we're not talking about typhoid we're not talking about the plague oh, the, you know my. COVID is a miserable uh, virus in a small portion of the population uh, it is a deadly virus I got my vaccine George got his vaccine I can report that without violating HIPAA laws I think um, mm -hmm. you know we did it because uh, we have enough knowledge to know that uh, it would benefit us long term to be able to participate without uh, being infected and infecting others. And we did that with the best medical knowledge available at the time. There are a lot of people out there who are getting different information about the vaccine who don't want to get the, virus, uh, the vaccine. That's fine. I'm not here to judge that. I'm here to tell you what I did. 
uh, out of my conscience, I said, I want to be a person who, you know, in this time in life when Jill and I are traveling around the country, I don't want to be <laughs> a carrier. <laughs> I don't want to be. I don't want to end up on CNN. It's this is the guy who did, brought COVID to Wisconsin. No, I don't want to be that guy. Um, but if you, you know, with the best information you have, decide not to get the vaccine, no judgment here. Sorry, I'm, I'm not going to judge you. Uh, you know, but you you do know that there is a virus out there, and please don't be a spreader of it. So. Yeah. But also, but also, Kevin, I think we need to understand that when we give up our our liberties, yeah, sure. our our personal identity, we're opening up the door for uh, the destruction of our society. Oh, absolutely. Um, I, I I I am a man. I am a man under authority because of my ordination vows, mm -hmm. and if the bishop asks me to do something, I will do it. Mm -hmm. But I cannot do I cannot compel lay people to do things and have no desire to do so and closing the churches has been was a fiasco that I think m many of us will never recover from fully closing and, the churches beyond two weeks was a fiasco where the, the, everybody and, in the world agreed that we'll, we'll have a 14 day complete shutdown to flatten the court. I've uh, I've done a lot. I've crunch. I take attendance every Sunday. I know everybody is, and it's fascinating. My Saturday night service, I'm still missing 75 percent of the people. My eight o'clock service, back to normal. My 10:30 service, I've got two thirds. And if I look at what's happening, the older people who go to Saturday night are scared to death by the media. They're scared to death of what is happening, and so. There are many of them who are so frightened they don't leave their house. They're still having their groceries delivered. They're still, you know, being told, uh, "Don't step foot outside, or you'll drop dead." And the ten thirty service, which is where you get the most sort of uh, marginal—I don't want to say marginal, but the more informed. eight o'clock—you get the people who come four times a month. Yeah. Ten thirty—you get the people who come two times a month. Those two time a month there's are now one time a month, now one time a quarter. And they're losing the church habit. And that's what I'm seeing. And so you have the psychological pressures of this hysteria. You have the contradictory scientific views. You have the politicizing of things, just making a perfect storm that can really harm uh, the Christian witness in this world. And at the end of the day, the Constitution and canons of the Episcopal Church require me to offer services every Sunday. Uh, I can't get out of that. And if I'm told by a bishop, I mean, I, I'm going to be putting the point soon. If the bishop says no more services, I've got, you know, the clear words of the church and I've got the clear words of the bishop. What do I do? Well, I have to obey the bishop. But if the bishop asks me to do something that is unlawful, what do I do? I don't have the money to hire a lawyer. Yeah. Um, what am I going to do? Mm -hmm. Well, and at we, the end of the day, online services just don't cut it. No, I, I mean, it, it's interesting. Our church, uh, I guess I can't tell you those discussions. Other churches have had the discussion, when do we stop live streaming? And to God, God be the glory, most churches have returned to a decent attendance for their main services. Um, that they're not talking anymore about cutting the live stream. The live stream is there, uh, you know, for a while anyway, for those who just can't make it in. But most people really want to go to church. Uh, at least we've seen that at our church. Uh, most people have returned to services. There are a couple people who, for health reasons, don't go to church. We aren't seeing the people not going to church because they're just tired and don't want to go to sun watch the service and don't want to go to service. Um, we're not seeing that. We thought we would see that. We're not seeing that at our church. Other churches, from what I've heard, have the same thing. People couldn't wait to get back to worship, for the most part. You know, see, so. my church is like a tech stock. In good times, it's going to be 10, 20, 30 times better than your average utility stock. Sure. In bad times, it's going to go through the floor. Yeah. Because the outreach that we're doing are to the unchurched. In other words, my 1030 service is specifically for 
people who may or may not, it's not whether or not they're Episcopalians, but whether or not they have a religious background. And so that service is getting hammered. The, the older person's service is hammered, mm -hmm. and the seeker, that, that's not the right word I want to use, the inquirer service yes. is getting hammered. Mm -hmm. And the 8 o'clock service where people are Episcopalians born and bred, and they come early to get a good tea time, that's just fine. But I don't want a church like that. <laughs> no. It, we could sit here and talk about it all day long, but let, let's give a mercy right now to our audience. We're at 55, 56 minutes. Mercy, people. We're sorry we went long, but, you know, even on slow news weeks, like August 24th, we got lots to talk about. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 682 of Anglican Unscripted.